Members of the Vancouver Police Department have been involved in the majority of the world's conflicts and peacekeeping missions since our inception in 1886, over 125 years ago. Well, and then I went into service at 17, so I didn't, you know, everybody was going, so everybody went. But you go back and, and you, you think about some of the guys and, and the things you did and, and the camaraderie. I mean, it was great. Life didn't mean much. Like, you know, you'd say, oh, so-and-so just was killed you. So that's too bad. It wasn't you. And, and that's the way people think. It's funny, you know. And I, it's, it's hard to believe, but that's what happens. You're just glad it's not you, you know. Well, there aren't, there aren't too many of the fellows left. That, uh, my navigator is gone. My wireless air gunner is gone. And uh, I think Jimmy Stewart is gone. And I think I'm about the only one of the four left. full of piss and vinegar and uh, and you're bulletproof and everything else and you get into the military very r uh, regimented uh, you you learn to shine your shoes and press your clothes and do your sewing and uh, you know you and, and you have to get along with people you know and, and it was a great for for respecting other people even though you're living for close quarters you, you, you kind of respected everybody's place right I got my call up for the army, and I didn't want to walk around the world, so I, I went and joined the Air Force. We did a lot. We saw a lot of the world. And he said, "Well, you'll join the Royal Navy. They'll drum some bloody sense into you." But the reason I wanted to go to sea is because of all these stories about Shanghai. So I joined the battleship King George V, and. Uh, I was servicing, I, I found out that I had exceptional hearing. So I worked ASDIX, which means listening for submarines. And they bombarded the beaches for quite a few hours before we got on the landing craft. And then they started us in Well, the Germans were just blowing us right out of the water. The whole landing craft was exploded. Half of us got in, I guess, but um, a tremendous amount never got to the shore. We sent over about uh, six new bombers, and they flattened that town, absolutely flattened. But they also took a lot of our troops, too, which you never hear about. And they're only giving us guns, but they're giving us bullets. So, I mean, this is serious shit we're getting into, you know. We marched through Tokyo with fixed bayonets, yeah. and I was 18. And I led the parade. I can safely say I flew Dakota from Burma to Ottawa. Well, that's a long way. When you go, I several times where I've been walking along and guys behind me, shells come over and they're depressing, you know, their heads taken off. It happens quite often. And there's bodies everywhere. And they have a detail that picks them up. Well, they can't get up every day, you see. They, we have to wait till we move on and then they pick up the corpse, whether it's German or Canadian or English, whatever. And that's not a squad I would want to be in. And 
a nice thing happened that Admiral Har Harcourt, who was the British Admiral, he requested the, the crew from the Prince Robert to get the guys out of Stanley Prison Camp because they were all Canadians still in prison. So it was Canadians rescuing Canadians. And I thought that was pretty neat, you know. He could have sent the liveys in there, but no, he sent Canadians to rescue Canadians. He was a good guy. Well, the killing part. I mean, uh, you know, you still had to do it, but you still, you, you didn't like it. At least I didn't like it, but we had to do it, because my job, that's what it was. I used to scare the hell out of me, so I used to get off my seat and sit on the tubular stealing so that my head was down. And we finished one action, I've forgotten where the hell we were. And my nickname was Jordy because of the part of England I'm from. One of the lads says, hey Jordy, have you had a look at the, the back of where you sit? And I said, what, the armor had all been torn up because one of the shells from the pom-pom had exploded when it came out. And if I'd been sitting there, I would have lost the back of my head. You got your snapper anchor and everything on the way we went out. Um, and the, the funny thing about it was uh, we, get out, we get out of there and, and we're backing up and we get into a minefield out there. And so the old man, he, he uh, knew he had a minefield. He had to plot his way back out. So he, he plotted his way out. And when we finally got on, he came on the air and he says, uh, he says, well, he said, we didn't get shot at. We got out of the minefield, he says, and he said, the laundry is now open for the cleaning of shorts. <laughs> and then they, the Armistice Day came, you know, the big celebration downtown and really was finished, you know what I mean? Oh, the streets were jammed. You couldn't walk in Gravel Street. There's no cars. There. Cars were just sitting there. Everybody's climbing top of the cars and screaming and yelling. And you never saw anything like it. Fantastic. <laughs> There are many Canadians, including Vancouver Police Department members, who never made it back home. Their sacrifice cannot be overstated. They left their families and friends behind to go to foreign shores and defend our way of life. The freedoms we enjoy today are a direct result of the pledge and commitment they made to this most honourable endeavour, maintaining freedom, peace and our security. This November 11th, I would encourage you all to attend Remembrance Day services with the Vancouver Police Department here in Vancouver at Memorial Park where we can remember Canadian Forces personnel who have served, mourn those who have fallen, remember their sacrifice and this high cost of freedom. Let's all show our community that we will remember them. Thank you. <laughs>